come and let us return unto the Lord. For he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up. And we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning. And he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly, and for the journeying of the camps. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Shalom Chabrin. Well, a lot of news has been going on, and I have um, not so much got into the depth of the news as far as the passing of Ariel Sharon. I uh, have not had a chance really to make a video about uh, his passing, other than when we first um, made this part public ourselves, which just seemed most everybody knew anyway. Uh, but just again, like I said, I want to just con 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 extend the condolences for him. This video here is not actually going to be about that. Um, but let me just say one thing too before though I go into this teaching here. Um, Ariel Sharon, we have to remember as him being the prime minister, he's actually followed very much in the same footsteps steps, or Benjamin Netanyahu, I should say, is following in the same footsteps that Ariel Sharon did. Um, and that is, when they first both became Prime Minister their first time, they were very much champions for the people. They were, would come out swinging. They were not going to give up land for a peace process whatsoever in Israel. Uh, but it, in both their cases, that second term is where that pressure began to really be poured in from around the world. And uh, I do not think that um, Prime Minister Sharon wanted to give up land. I do not believe that he wanted to uh, push the people out of these uh, out of the settlements, but nonetheless, he began to do that. Um, there's all kinds of speculations of why uh, Ariel Sharon went into a coma. I know there was a rabbi that that, that cursed him for what he was doing, um, but I will say this: even with Benjamin Netanyahu right now, he's trying to back out of this agreement as well at this point. But it doesn't matter who is going to be the prime minister. Someone is going to make this covenant. Although it is totally wrong to do, it's going to happen. It's got to fulfill Bible prophecy, and that's the sad part of it. Um, I do wonder, though, when Ariel Sharon was beginning to make the steps that he was doing, it was premature as far as the timing. God had to get everybody in place that needed to be in place, and it definitely was not the time as of yet. So it looks now that that time is falling into place. The stage is being set worldwide. The Pope that is in there now, um, and, and I can't even tell you what's going to happen. If, if Benjamin Netanyahu does back out of this, uh, I, I really am concerned for his life at that point because the devil is, in, is bound and determined to make this peace process go forward. They're bound and determined to make it happen, whether Israel likes it or not. Uh, so it's a very serious, serious situation. And with that in mind, 
I think it's very good to uh, bring this out, this, this message I want to bring out to you. Now, this message was kind of inspired by a comment I posted on Facebook. Why do we, why do men wear a kippah in the religious circles of Jews? Uh, mostly among your, amongst the Orthodox Jews, both conservative and Hasidic Jews wear a kippah. Uh, it is, a, is an outward sign that God is over us. It is, it is a tradition. It is not biblical in the sense that it was not ordained in the law of Moses. Uh, we don't find that Abraham wore a, a kippah or a yarmulke, whichever you would want to call it. But we do find one passage that actually caught my attention uh, recently and that's in the book of Samuel, where God had, um, God had, or excuse me, David, not God had, but David, when he was uh, leaving the city of Jerusalem, him and his men with him, and his company, his family, their children, uh, because his son Absalom had uh, exalted himself and had taken over the kingdom of Israel. And so David fled the city, and as they were leaving, they go out of the city mourning, and all the men had their heads covered. Uh, David actually went out barefooted, and they went out mourning. So at that rate there, um, it really made me start wondering more about this. Now, I was doing this research because of the series that we're doing right now in the Vatican, and by the way, we are in a mode of research so we're not quite ready to put out, uh, that would be part three, but that is coming very soon. And also for those of you that have been waiting for the video on, uh, on um, our stand unconditionally, we stand with Israel with your footages and stuff. Uh, I am hoping to get to back to that very soon. Hopefully this week I can get in there and get that finished so we can get that to our prime minister to show our solidarity with him. Um, we've just had some issues come up uh, that's kind of backed me up, different little issues in life, you know how it goes, your car breaks down, something doesn't work, you know, and then you're having to deal with the financial issues with that and whatever it takes to take care of those things. But anyway, so like you guys, we run into those same problems as well. Um, but let me just get right into this. Let's first kind of set the foundation for this. Um, this is a very serious message for my Jewish brethren and my Jewish sisters as well that may uh, happen to come and listen to these videos because you're going to see things in here that speak about Mashiach in a way that maybe you have never thought about it before. Uh, and, and perhaps it's been spoken about before and I'm just not aware of it, uh, but I'm going to share some things with you here from the, from the Word of God. Uh, and by the way, Absalom's name, his actual name is Avshalom or Avishalom. Uh, Avshalom is normally his name is shortened. Uh, I would really prefer to use that instead of Absalom, uh, kind of a tongue twister to say Absalom in English there. But uh, his name actually means my father, uh, my father is peace or uh, father peace, but my father is peace is what it technically means. So Av Avshalom, uh, he was Solomon's son. And those of you that know the story of Tamar, his sister, how she was defiled by Abnon, his brother, which these are all David's children. Uh, but uh, in the course of this um, uh, defilement of, of Absalom's sister, Tamar, he plots a, a, a plan to be able to take revenge for his sister's defilement. Um, and when we say defilement, I mean, technically she was raped. I mean, that's just, she was forced to lay with him against her will. And she begged him not to do this, but to go before the king and you know let it be done properly because she said the king would not withhold her from him. Um, anyway though, he does take and eventually he's able to bring about revenge. He has his servants kill Amnon and David begins to mourn uh, the loss of, of that son because it, even though it's a family squabble, it's still the death of a child is the death of a child. And he mourns him. Uh, Absalom, Ab Ab he flees and uh, goes away from David because of the fear of David wanting to have him killed for what he did to his brother. Uh, he's in exile basically for three years. And through some work of Joab, um, he's able to come back to Israel. But when he does come back, um, David says he can come back and go to his own place, but he will—he is not to see my face. And so for two more years, 
And David has it to where, although he's in Israel, he's not allowed to see his face. Um, and then finally, uh, Absalom, he's, he's tired of not being able to see his father. Uh, and, and yet at the same time, he's got a conspiracy brewing in his mind all the time. So he inquires of uh, Joab to, to try to get him to go to, to go to David and to bring his cause before him. Uh, and he kind of gets the cold shoulder from, from Joab until finally he has, has his fields burnt. Uh, that got his attention. So once he's got uh, uh, Joab's attention, he goes before David and requests an audience for David with his son, uh, Absalom. By then, and of course, even when David allowed him to come back, David's heart was already towards him as it, as it, as it was. But he just wasn't willing to let him see his face yet. Now keep these things in mind. These are very important um, bits and pieces of information because if you begin to think about it, brothers, this is our forefathers when they, uh, Absalom is a type of our forefathers that were in exile um, during the Babylonian times and, and then they come back, uh, you know, and then that desire, to, wanting to see Mashiach, um, and, uh, but yet at that time we just have, had not seen him uh, to, to this point. We were wanting to get deliverance there and uh, after coming back from the Babylonian captivity. And so, of course, the time passes there in that history. Um, and then, of course, we come all the way up to uh, what is called in the, um, the modern times. Uh, I'll use that calendar for the sake of the Christian people that are, that are listening to this video as well. 70 AD, the, the temple is destroyed and our people are once again scattered to all the world. Um, so, at, at, at this point here, um, when King David comes back, he kisses uh, Absalom. And it came to pass, and, and we're going into chapter 15 is where we're going to kind of pick up at. Uh, that Absalom prepared him uh, chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Now he's beginning to start to exalt himself at this time, is what he does once he's got the favor of his father. Uh, dropping down to verse 4, Absalom said, Moreover, O, oh, that I would, that were made a judge in the land, that every man which hath any uh, suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him uh, justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to them, to do him of the of his sense, in other words, they bowed to him, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And this manner did Absalom to all of Israel that came to the king for judgment. And Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. This is key right here. It's very key that we see, that you see what I'm talking about here. Because David is a type of Moshiach. He is a type of the Messiah because clearly the scripture says that the Mashiach, the, 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 uh, his son would sit upon his throne and rule Israel. And we realize that the, the, the son of David, uh, not talking about Solomon, but the son of David would be the Messiah himself. Uh, and so God is going to take with David and he's going to show us in this story here a beautiful uh, type of the Messiah, and in this case here, I'm going to talk to you about our not recognizing who he was, and then looking back at the example that God has given us in the in, in the reading of the uh, the Torah through the prophets as well, the Navim ve'Kotavim, and uh, to to recognize where we went wrong. So, uh, so Av uh, Shalom, he's stealing the hearts of Israel, and yet David is the anointed king there. Um, so it comes to, we get to verse 7, it says, And it comes to pass after 40 years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. And so for thy servants uh, vowed a vow while I, while I abode at Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said unto him, Go in peace. And he arose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And with Absalom uh, went two hundred men out of Jerusalem and that, that were called, and they went in their simplicity, and they knew not anything. 
And Avshalom sent for um, Ahothophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor, from his city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices, and the conspiracy was strong, for the people in, uh, increased continually with Avshalom. Now, this man's name that, that, that goes with him, that was David's counselor, is a very important person right here. His name is actually Achitafel in Hebrew, Achitafel. And that means my brother is fallen. Um, it's really incredible when I was reading this. You're going to find out a little bit later that Achitafel, he commits suicide. And as I begin to look at David, and brothers, please be patient with me when I say this. Don't stop your video. Please hear me out. Take the time to hear me out. David is a perfect type of Yeshua of Nazareth. He is a beautiful type of him in this. And, and, and I ask you this. I know there's a lot of debate over Rabbi Kaduri and the prophecies that he had when he was here. We know that he prophesied uh, many things and a lot of debate over whether or not he prophesied of who Mashiach was and what his name was. Uh, but just take a little time to hear me out on this. Uh, same thing with Ariel Sharon passing. One of his things was that when Ariel Sharon passed, that Mashiach would reveal himself to Israel shortly thereafter. So I'm I'm imploring you to take the time to, to hear me out on this. So, but anyway, so uh, Achitafel is my brother has fallen is what this really means right here, and um, and he reminds me of Judas. So uh, anyway, uh, and, and there came a messenger to David saying, "The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom." And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Um, make speed to depart uh, from Absalom, excuse me, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servants said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint. Now, the reason why they said that is because they knew they could defeat uh, uh, Absalom regardless. They would go into battle and they would defeat him because God will deliver anyone, no matter what the size of the army is, God will deliver them into, into David's hand. But David doesn't want to do that. He, he gives this thing here saying that they would come in with the edge of the sword. Yeah, there would be loss of life, but God would still deliver it to David. But he's not, this is not the case though. And this is what really is such a beautiful part of this story. David is a type of Yeshua. And Yeshua, though Israel was blinded to who he was, and that's really what the case here is. Absalom, if Absalom really knew who his father was, he would have never tried to exalt himself higher than his father or to try to subvert his father and taking the kingdom away from his father. But he was blinded by greed, by popularity, whatever the case may be is what was blinding him. And he deceived the people. Not only did Absalom deceive, you know, did Satan deceive him, but he also deceived the people. And the people fell for it. And when Yeshua was here on the earth, the rabbis of that day, not recognizing him to be the king, Moshiach, that was to come, the king of Israel, but instead they talked nice words and got the people to, to side with them and to believe them and to reject Moshiach when he actually came. Now, this was all, here's the beautiful part though. So don't be angry with yourself over this. It was prophesied of this. Same thing with Nathan the prophet when he came to, to David and he prophesied. You know, the sword will be against your house for what you did to Uriah. You took Bathsheba, his wife. So this is, this is prophesied. The same with Mashiach. Daniel tells us that Mashiach would come and he would be cut off, not for himself. 
Daniel chapter 9. Somewhere, I forget now, verse anywhere from verse 24 to 27, somewhere in that area there. So, let's take a look at this a little bit deeper now then. Um, so, the king's servant, uh, so, and the king's servant, verse 15, said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready, okay, we know that, to do, to do whatever he says. And the king went forth, and all of his household after him, and, he, and the king left ten women which were concubines to keep the house. Now, my Jewish brothers, you may not get this one here, but you're going to get it after I tell you, but I guarantee you one thing, the Christian people are going to see this one here. Ten concubines. There is a scripture in the Christian Bible, and I do have the, 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 uh, my computer with me real quick um, to pull that up, and I really want you to see this for the Jewish people as well. It's called the Ten Virgins, and uh, let's see, I misspelled it, so let me get this right. And that's found in Matthew 25, Verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. Uh, that, the virgins are, 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 the, are the Christian believers. And five are wise and five are foolish. Five escape the judgments of God, the, the wrath of God and go on a rapture. The other five Still virgins, still love the Lord, still loyal to him, going to tribulation for the purification. You know, that, that's what happens to them. Now, oddly enough, though, we find here David leaves behind ten concubines. Now, what is a concubine? It's a common law wife. The, the, she, is, she is living with him, but her... The marriage has not been formally done to consummate that the, the, the covenant that they have between each other or the agreement they have between each other to be married. That's the same thing in Christianity. When Yeshua came, he came to his own, and his own received him not. That's what the prophecy said. He would come to his own, and his own would receive him not. Same thing with David. You understand what I'm saying, brothers? He's there for his own, his own children, Absalom. And Absalom crying out for, his own, for the blood of his own father. He was willing to go in battle at the, at the council of his own uh, counselors and take the life of David. That, that's what Ahithophel, that's what he actually tells him to do. Go out and kill him. Overtake him. His own father, he was willing to kill him. And in his own name, his own name, Avi Shalom, Av Shalom, my father is peace, is testifying of the coming of Mashiach. Oh, it's incredible. So the concubines are left to do what? To keep the house. Do you know that God, I, I've told you guys before, we see it in the story of Ruth. Ruth gleans from the four corners of the field. Why? Because in the law of Moses, the Gentile or the poor among you, we were to not ever glean, we were not to, to, to harvest the corners of the field. We would leave that to the poor and to the Gentiles for them to have something as well. And it was only a type of God showing that the Gentiles in modern days would help gather the lost tribes of Israel that were what? Scattered to the four corners of the earth. And they're to help her to bring back the lost of Israel. Who? Ruth, the Moabitess, the Gentile. See, Boaz, he wanted to marry her, but he has to redeem Israel first. He has to redeem Naomi in order to be able to get Ruth, the Moabitess. So in this case here, who, who, the ten concubines, they represent Ruth. They represent though the five virgins, five wise, and five foolish. And they're there to tend to have to keep the house. And you know what? Do you know what Absalom did to them? He takes and puts a tent up on top of the house for everyone to see in the sight of Israel and takes and sleeps with every one of them, defiles every one of them. And does it publicly and doesn't care. 
But those women were faithful. Regardless of the ridicule, remember Absalom, or Absalom, however you pronounce it from your own Bible there, he is a type of Israel that rejects the Messiah and the descendants of Israel as they come down through the, through the, through the years after that, while they're in exile. And the ten concubines type the Christian believers of today and, of course, for the last 2,000 years. And though Israel, because of her not recognizing who her Messiah is, is willing to mistreat her publicly. This is why you see in the videos the Orthodox Jews spitting on the Christians, don't want anything to do with the Christians, and many more other such testimonies that people use against the Jewish people and condemn them. This is why replacement theology goes so rampant, because why? The Christian has not, the, let me put it this way, the professing Christian has not recognized that Israel is blind and will be that way until God returns. All right, so that's, that's beautiful there. And the king went forth and all the people after him and tarried in a place that was far off. And all of his servants uh, passed on beside him and all the Cherethites and all the Pelishites, etc., they all go up. Now, as they're going up, we're going to skip forward just a little bit to save time uh, to verse 22. It says, And David said to uh, Iti, Go pass over, and to Iti and to, to Gittai, pass over, and all his men and all the little ones that were with him. Uh, let me just, I'm sorry, go to verse 23. Uh, I don't want to get you sidetracked on anything here. And all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people passed over the king. Passed over the king also himself passed over the brook of Kidron. Now this is in the Kidron Valley. This is where, if you're looking in Israel today, if you were standing there on the Temple Mount, looking to the Mount of Olives, that valley that runs through there, that's the Kidron Valley. I've crossed it many times by foot. I actually just go right down there to the Pool of Siloam and work your way up and, and cross over that valley there and, and, and come up to the Mount of Olives. Uh, that's actually East Jerusalem. This is where the uh, Palestinians are, are working to get their state uh, or, or to make their capital. They're going to, that's where they're going to split the city and, and break God's covenants. Uh, and by the way, in the, in the Vatican series, I'm really going to go into and really settle this issue because I know there's some people that believe that Israel today is really not meant to be there. Um, they get into the Zionist theories. They get into the Tex Mars uh, nonsense of uh, the Jews of today are Khazars and the ones that are in Israel are not really Jews. This is all nonsense, and we will settle this in this Vatican series. You'll find out what that is. Now, there is, there is evil in the background. We know that, okay? But let's, let's say that for another time. Sorry about that. Okay, so they went over. They crossed the Kidron. And the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. And to Zadok also all the Levites were with him, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of God. And they set down uh, the Ark of God. And uh, Abithar went up until all the people and had done passing out of the city. And the king said unto Zadok, Carry back the Ark of God into the city. If I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me again and show me both it and and his habitation. Hmm. See, that's actually prophecy right there. You guys may not real, realize this, but what is this? When Yeshua comes, he's coming back, and there's going to be a temple. He's going to see it, and he's going to see the ark as well. Now, I, I don't want to get into that and speculate on that, but I'm wondering if the ark isn't going to end up being back in the temple when he comes. Um, now, you got to keep in mind, of course, the temple that's being built now or this is going to be the third temple is, well, I know my brethren, we're hoping for it to be a good thing, but Satan is going to certainly try to use that um, and get his little glory time in as well. Uh, verse 26, but if, it, but if he thus say, I have no delight in thee, behold, here I am, let him do to me which seemeth good unto him. Now, brothers, let me tell you something here. I said that David is a beautiful type of Yeshua right here. And look at, you, look at David's words right here. If I find favor in the Lord, I'll come back. I'll see the temple. I'll see the Ark of the Covenant. 
But if not, let him do what seemeth good to me. Now, we have been willing to condemn this man, Yeshua, the man called Jesus of Nazareth, because we say that he never, never was the Messiah. Well, plainly in the story of David, he goes into exile, he goes up the Mount of Olives, and he weeps as well over Jerusalem, as well as all the company that are with him. And he even says, if I find favor in his sight. So the thing is, as Yeshua comes, he goes and weeps up on the Mount of Olives and says, Olives and says, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. So your house is left to you desolate until you say, he that come, uh, blessed is he that comes in the name of Hashem. So if he's found favor in the sight of God, then he's promised to come back. And if Rabbi Kaduri, if this truly is his prophecy, which I believe it is, that when Ariel Sharon dies, Mashiach would reveal himself shortly thereafter. Now we've got to be careful of what we define as shortly thereafter. Is that weeks, months, days? I don't know. Is it a year or two? I'm not sure. I have no idea. But instead of condemning this man, Yeshua, maybe we should start thinking a little bit more about the types that are laid out here in the Word of God for us. Okay, now, let's move on with it. Verse 27, the king said also unto Zadok the priest, Art not thou a seer? That's a prophet. Return into the city in peace, and your two sons with you, Ahamaz thy son, and Jonathan the son of Abithar. Hmm. See, I will tarry in the plain of the wilderness until there come word from you to certify me. Isn't that interesting? Now he goes there with his sons. It really reminds me of Moses and Elijah. Elisha was Elijah's son, spiritually speaking, just like Joshua was Moses' son, spiritually speaking. They were both in his room. Now, we never, you won't find anything that happens with their sons in this case here. Why? Because this story is a type, but you're going to find out that the two elders, they do send the word to David, everything. But isn't it funny how he says, um, let me back up and read it again. Verse 28, I will tarry in the plain of the wilderness until there come word from you to certify me. Okay, let's, let's look at more from the, from the Jewish Bible for my brethren that are following along. Uh, I know you'd probably prefer to have it there, so let me just read that to you real quick. Uh, we are in chapter 15. Uh, that is verse 20, what was that, 28, yes, 28, verse 28. And uh, he says right here, see, I am remaining in the plains of the wilderness until word comes from you to, to inform me. Hmm. He's got two witnesses there. Just a thought, think about it, it's interesting. All right. Zadok therefore and Abathar carried the ark of God again to Jerusalem, and they tarried there. And David went up into the, to ascent the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up and had his head covered, and he went barefoot, and all the people that was with him covered every man his head, and they went up weeping as they went up. It is a sign of mourning. The God of Israel has had our people take up a custom, I really believe, of wearing a kippah, wearing a yarmulke, to show a sign of mourning, whether we realize it or not, that our king is rejected. And we wonder why this custom has been for 2,000 years. We, we have it because God is over us. It's a sign of mourning. We rejected our king. And so we wear it to this day. Mourning. Not even realizing what we're doing. Let's move on down. And David went up by, excuse me, verse 29. Is that therefore? And of course, they went back and they tarried there. And David went up. Okay, we read that. I'm sorry. Verse 31. And one told David, saying, 
uh, spirit, uh, conspirators with Absalom and David, well, excuse me, and one told David saying, uh, oh, Achiophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O oh Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Achiophel into foolishness. And it came to pass that when David was come to the top of the mountain where he worshiped God, behold, uh, Hushai, the archite, came to meet him with his coat rent and earth upon his head, and to, and to whom David said, If thou passest on with me, then thou shalt be a burden unto me. But if thou return to the city and say to, to Absalom, I will be thy servant, O king, as I have been thy father's servant hereto, so will I now also be thy servant. Then mayest thou for me defeat the counsel of uh, Achilfeb. And hast thou not there with thee Zadok and uh, Abathar, the priests? Therefore it shall be that what things soever thou shalt hear out of the king's house, thou shalt tell it to Zadok and, uh, and uh, Abathar, the priests. Behold, they have there with them their two sons, uh, Ahamaz and, Z and Zadok's son, Jonathan. Abathar son by by them ye shall send unto me everything that you can hear. So Hushai David's friend came unto me into the city, and Absalom came un, into Jerusalem. Now I, I can't say for sure, but I have wondered if that's not a type of the Holy Spirit, because uh, just just a thought. I, I don't know that one. I really won't say. I just kind of leave that one alone. But it's just a little thought that did pass through my mind. But I'm not settled in my heart what that types out. Uh, but anyhow, what happens, though, David, though, he goes into exile. As he's going out, though, another thing happens to him that was, that was interesting as well. Um, let me just find it here. 11. And the king David sent to Zadok and to Abathar, the priest, saying, Speak unto the elders of Judah, saying, Why are you last to bring the king back to his house? Hmm. You know why he addresses Judah to start with? Because when Yeshua came to this earth, the ten tribes of Israel were not there. The tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, and the Levites were the only ones that were there. So he asked that question. Why weren't you the first ones to bring me back? Seeing the speech of all Israel has come to the king, even to his house. You are my brethren, you are my bones and my flesh. Wherefore then are you the last to bring back the king? Yeshua actually took and by his spirit, by the spirit of Almighty God, the Ruach HaKadosh, he has gone and witnessed to the entire world of who he is. And yet here we are, the Jewish people, the tribe of Judah from which he... You, you, do you understand why he says this, though? Really understand this, why he really picks on Judah right there? Because Yeshua is from your tribe. And you're the last ones to recognize who he is. That's why he says, I'm bone of your bones and flesh of your flesh. Just as David was, so was Yeshua. He's letting you know, you know, I am, a, I, am, I am a son of Israel and you've rejected me. And you're the last ones to call me back home. And say to Amasa, art thou not of my bone, of my flesh, and God do so to me? And more also, if thou be not captain of the host before me continually in the room of Joab. And he bowed the heart of all the men of Judah, even as the heart of one man. So that they sent this word unto the king, Return thou all and all thy servants. You notice though what he, how he does this? How did, how, did, how, did, how did David do this? Remember, he's a type of Jesus. And King David sent to Zadok and to Abathar, the priest, see, the two witnesses, saying, speak unto the elders of Judah, saying, why are you the last to bring the king back to his house? That's interesting. 
So the king returned and came to Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal and to meet the king, to conduct the king over Jordan. And Shimei, the son of Gera, Gera, a Benjamite, that's the guy that was spitting on him when he was going out and cursing him, which was of the uh, uh, Baharim, hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. He was one of the first ones there. Why Benjamin? Remember what I told you guys before in time past? Benjamin was never guilty of the blood of Yeshua. When I say blood of Yeshua, I'm talking about going back to Joseph in his day. He was a Benjamin. His brother Benjamin was not guilty in throwing his brother in the pit. It was the other ten tribes that did it. But I said that in this day, though, the tribe of Benjamin is re represented by the Jews that are living in this. Benjamin represented those, the Jews that live in Israel today. We were not there. We were not the ones that actually put Yeshua on a cross and had him crucified or turned him over to the Romans, however you want to put it. But we're standing there with the cup in our back, just like Benjamin was in Joseph's day. What are we going to do about it? In this case here, Benjamin was willing to spit on him, run him out, and hated him and everything else. I've seen plenty of videos where my brethren do stuff the same to this day. But you'll find out they're going to be some of the first ones there when he reveals himself very soon. Notice the love of David. And there were a thousand men and Benjamin with him and Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul and his 15 sons and his 20 servants with him. And they went over Jordan before the king and they there went over a ferry, a boat to carry of the king's household and to do what thought good. And Shemai, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was come over Jordan. And he said unto the king, Let not my lord impute iniquity unto me. Oh my gosh, you know something I just realized? Shemai is not the ones that are going to meet him there. He's a representation of the Jews that have, for the last 2,000 years, that have cursed Jesus. Because he crosses the river Jordan before David comes to this side. And even though he did all this cursing against David, David has mercy on him. Watch what he says. I just caught that. I just realized that. Brother, do you realize this gives hope for all the Jewish people for the last 2,000 years that have condemned Yeshua and never believed him and spit on him and cursed him and did the most vilest things of all. Watch what he says here. Hmm. And Shemai the son of Gur fell down before the king as he was come over Jordan and said unto the king, Let not thy, my lord impute iniquity unto me. Neither do thou remember that, that which thy servant did per perversely the day that my lord the king went out of Jerusalem that the king should take it to his heart. For thy servant doth know it that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I am come to the first day of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my lord the king. But Abshai the son of Zedariah answered and said, Shall not Shemai be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? Hmm. Let me take a look at this real quick for you guys in Hebrew. Let's just... Let's just be sure about this one, boy. Oh, I, 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 this one's got my attention here. Uh, chapter 19, verse 22. Where are we at with 22? Shemai, be put to death despite uh, this apology, for he caused the anointed of Hashem. For he cursed the anointed of Hashem. Okay, now let me just see now. Let's go. Okay, Kafbet. Okay, the on of she ben Yorabah, the Yomer Hat Hat Zot Lo Yamat Shemi Ki Kalal et Mashiach 
משיח אדוני. Tell me, David, in the type of Moshiach. Moshiach Hashem. Yes, he is a type. Plain as day in the word of God. All right. And David said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah, that you should this day be ever adversaries unto me? Shall there any man be put, excuse me, shall there be any man put to death this day in Israel? For do, do not I know that I am this day king over Israel? Therefore the king said unto Shammai, Thou shalt not die. And the king swore unto him. And uh, Mepho, uh, Mephobesheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king, and had neither dressed his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. By the way, just so you guys know, a couple of things about this, and this is where we'll close at. Um, it's hard to pronounce his name here. Mephobeseth, this man here, this was Jonathan's son. He's the guy that when his mother, when he was five years old, his mother was fleeing after she heard the death of Jonathan and Saul that happened down at Beit Shean, and she dropped him, and it injured his feet. He was ended up, ended up being crippled. David took him in and, um, and cared for him his whole life. When David fled, his servant lied to David and said that he went down into the city and was claiming to be now restored the king. The kingdom of Saul is gonna be restored unto him. And we see plainly that this man here was so loyal to David's love for him that he didn't shave, he didn't wash his clothes, he didn't change the raiment that was on his feet because his feet were crippled up. Now it says beard here. It's actually the only time that, it's, that scripture is used differently here. It doesn't use the words um, zaken. Zaken is also used for the word old in Hebrew. But uh, that's normally what's used for beard. This word here that's used in Hebrew is um, translated mainly like mustache or lip. And the reason being, I, th I think, and I, I, I think the translating of the beard would still be acceptable. The point what God was making here, because even in Orthodox uh, Judaism, uh, a lot of the Jews, they believe according to the law of Moses, which is in Leviticus 21.5, that you're not to mar or, or to... Um, damage the corners of your beard and so on the acidic juice uh, a lot of times I let the sideburn part grow down because I believe that that's it and some just let the whole beard grow without stopping but they always trim the mustache it's just part of it but I think this is the reason why he mentions it this way here he uses the Hebrew word here because he didn't trim mustache so in other words he didn't trim anything and there again I could not help but think of the scripture in Zechariah chapter 3 where it speaks about Joshua, the high priest. And he comes and his clothes are filthy garments. But the mercy of God is returning to Israel according to Zechariah and it says, take off the filthy garments on him and put on the clean raiment, clean clothes. Could it be when it said not to trim the mustache or the beard? In other words, he didn't let anything be trimmed and everything. Could it be that God has left us another sign? That in the law, the growing of that beard would be also a sign of mourning, of the rejecting of Mashiach? I don't know. I know that's one thing we've never understood, why God said do not trim or touch the corners of the beard. So it's just an interesting thought. I hope this is a blessing to you. God bless you. We love all of you. Those of you that support the ministry, we really thank you. Your continued support is what helps us to be able to do this more and more. Um, and pray for us more than you ever have. I ask you to remember Ariel Sharon's family uh, as they grieve. In Judaism, grieving is 30 days. And... Um, just ask you to continue to pray for them. Pray for us here. I have a very strange feeling in my heart 
many things are fixing to happen. We need you. We need your help more than ever now. God bless you.